Good afternoon. At first glance, Anne West appears rather like a typical college student. As a busy junior, double majoring in psychology and Spanish at Wellesley, and somehow still manages to find time to run, travel, and even watch a little TV. She's what's known as a Whovian. <laughs> oh, you have kindred spirits, Anne. <laughs> That's a Doctor Who fan for the uninitiated. But delve a little deeper, and you will find that Anne is far from typical. Many of us like to travel, but how many of us celebrated our 21st birthday in Antarctica? having previously visited the other six continents. Many of us have an interest in our genetic lineage, and particularly in our inherited predisposition to disease. But how many of us have had our whole genome sequenced? All three billion beautiful base pairs of it. Anne has, and so indeed have her parents, John and Judy, and her brother, Paul. Of course, I'm going to let Anne tell you the details of her family's genome journey, but allow me to share a few highlights of Anne's remarkable career to date. While still a high school student, Anne took it upon herself to decipher the raw genotype and sequencing data from her family, armed only with a family computer and an Excel spreadsheet. Her painstaking research resulted in the discovery of sites of recombination or crossovers in her family's DNA and the identification of allelic variants that can be used to predict disease risk. Recognizing Anne's intellectual strength and independence, Dr. George Church at Harvard invited her to participate in two summer research internships, during which she contributed to the identification of error mechanisms in next-generation sequencing approaches. Most recently, Anne and her father collaborated with Stanford University researchers, researchers Ewan Ashley and Frederick Dewey to demonstrate the value of whole genome sequencing of first-degree family members as a means both of predicting a person's predisposition to certain diseases and, importantly, their responsiveness to therapeutic drugs in common use. These findings, which were published in Plo's Genetics with Anne and her father as co-authors, have major implications for the emerging field of personalized medicine, of which we have heard much today. Just in case you are worried that Anne spends her days chained to a lab or a computer terminal, fear not. She spent last summer conducting oceanographic research and learning how to sail aboard the Robert C. Seaman scientific ship. And following this symposium, she will return to Cordoba, Spain, to resume her semester abroad. Given all that Anne has accomplished in her first two decades, I, for one, am excited to see what the next two decades will hold for her. Perhaps a trip to a certain Swedish academy? Who knows? But let's return to the present. The title of Anne's seminar is Whole Genome Sequencing of a Healthy Family of Four, Scientific, Medical, and Personal Perspectives. Please join me in welcoming Miss Anne West to the Brown Symposium. Hello. As Maria just said, today I will be presenting on the whole genome sequencing of my family from scientific, medical, and personal perspectives. Before I start, that was taken in Antarctica on my 21st birthday. A lot of the presentations today have dealt with whole genome sequencing from a medical perspective and from a broader perspective. And I will be presenting on my own personal experience having been sequenced. First, however, I'd like to discuss my family's medical background. Before we were sequenced, or even genotyped with the service 23andMe, we knew that we had a family history of several different diseases. Cancer, lung cancer and colon cancer to be specific, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, deep vein thrombosis, and diabetes type 2, not type 1. This may seem like quite a hefty list for medically significant variants to have in a family, but actually this is from my entire extended family. And for an ex entire extended family, this list is of about normal length. All of my immediate fam 
family members and some of my extended family, including my grandparents, shown here in the pictures, were already tested in 2007 with 23andMe geno genome-wide genotype testing. This was back when 23andMe was allowed to do medically related genotype testing. So we were able to examine some of our medical variants with 23andMe and, some, and get started on our own genomic analysis with help from 23andMe and the medical information that they provided us. An important tool in analyzing your genome is to have a family tree, particularly if you're examining the DNA of your entire family. So here I have a family tree of my own extended family. The circle on the bottom would be me. I was 17 at the time this was created. And this square would be my younger brother, Paul, with the circle up here being my mother and this being my dad. The lists of variations underneath are phenotypic variations that were seen in different members of my family. Genotyp Genotypic information was not added to this particular family tree, though I have others that do include genotypes as they were inherited throughout my family. In the medical analysis of our genomes, I focused on vein thrombosis, which is a variant to do with, cl with blood clotting. In the genetic mutation factor V Leiden, and actually this is the factor V protein right up here, there's an increased propensity for blood clots that can lead to harmful clots forming on the insides of your, the veins in one's legs and sometimes moving up to the heart, lungs, or brain, causing heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, or even strokes. However, this is quite a treatable variant. And as it turns out, there are simple lifestyle changes that you can make in order to avoid having these undesired blood clots, such as hydrating well, remembering to stretch on long airplane flights, and later on in life, taking warfarin medication and avoiding certain types of birth control if you're a woman. This is actually a fairly common variant. About 2 to 5% of the United States population has this factor V Leiden mutation. Moving on from 23andMe analysis to whole genome sequencing, this is a slide narrating the process of whole genome sequencing. So up at the left here, we have the prescription form from Dr. Navio, who was a medical geneticist working for Illumina, to have our genome sequenced. At the top center, when my family had their genome sequenced, you actually had to have a blood draw in order to take blood out, and later the DNA would be extracted and sequenced from your blood. So my family had to go to the local hospital in order to have that done before it could be sent off to the lab for sequencing. Once it was run through the Illumina sequencer, this sequencer spot image, not nearly as pretty as Dr. Davies' image, in the previous presentation, but you still get the general idea, is the raw data from the DNA sequencer before a computer algorithm analyzes it and says, OK, I'm going to separate out the genome into a series of different reads, about 200 to 300 base pairs long, line them all up on top of each other, and then organize them into what you see here at a larger scale. When you, have, you go up closer, that's the next image you see in the sequence, and now you can see how the exact nucleotides are all aligned by the algorithm. Once you've arranged a sequence, you can actually line that person's genome sequence up against the reference, and comparing the two, you can find places where the new genome sequence differs from the human reference genome sequence typically at places of one nucleotide, and these are known as single nucleotide variants or polymorphisms, abbreviated as SNPs. They're in this table right here, so you can see this is the chromosome at the left. Next to it, you can see the location in base pairs on the chromosome where this mutation is located. 
and you can see the reference variant right next to your variant, and it will also tell you, since humans have two copies of everything, if you're homozygous for being different or just heterozygous for being different. This is the Illumina consent form for being sequenced. I had to sign this when I was 17 in order to be able to send my blood off to the lab for sequencing. My brother, my mom, and my dad had to do the exact same thing. So in order to make sure that we'd actually uh, read the contract, Dr. Navio, a medical geneticist from Illumina, came over to our house. We had read the contract in advance, but he discussed the implications of us having our genome sequenced with us. Then he went through the pages of this, mostly, and then we signed it with him present so that he could witness that, yes, we did consent, and yes, we fully understood what we were getting ourselves into. Now, this is the start of what we were really getting ourselves into. When we had our genome sequenced, what happened was the DNA came back from Illumina's lab. The DNA didn't come back from Illumina's labs, but the sequence did. And this was really old-fashioned. It was four years ago, so they weren't even using iPads. They had to give us a computer hard drive in order to hold everything. Now, the computer hard drive came with the even more old-fashioned paper sequence report, which is mostly technical details. You can see when we were sequenced, the blood sample. They also collected a saliva sample from all four of us in order to confirm that no, there were not any mix-ups between genomes, and yes, they really were sequencing the correct person. As promised, Illumina's data was entirely technical. Illumina did not promise a medical analysis. If they had promised a medical analysis, then they would probably be in a similar situation with the FDA to 23andMe. But instead, they give you a lot of raw data on your DNA sequence. So they can give you coverage, they summarize your coverage data, which is the number of reads piled on top of each other in any given area of your genome that have been put together by a computer algorithm into a single sequence that you interpret as your genome. In this chart on the right, you can see that of all the single nucleotide polymorphisms in my DNA, about 10% of the polymorphisms in my DNA were completely new. Illumina or nobody else who had done any sequencing had ever seen those particular mutations before. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, wow, that's strange. How can someone have that many mutations? Was she exposed to radiation as a child? Actually, no, I was not. Since I was one of, not the first people to be sequenced, but not a lot of people had been sequenced before me, there were still quite a few new single nucleotide variants to be discovered when I was sequenced, so there were a fair number that Illumina was able to discover by sequencing me, as well as by sequencing other members of my family. Zooming, in, zooming out to the whole coverage of my genome, you can see in this image that there are a whole bunch of boxes labeled one up here through 22. This one labeled M is my mitochondrial DNA. So here you have all of my autosomal chromosomes. You have my mitochondrial DNA my X chromosome, and the box labeled Y is empty because obviously I am a girl. But if you were looking at my brother's coverage, then you would see something in the Y as well. You'll notice that there are gaps in the coverage where this gap in the, the blue line signifying amount of coverage in your genome means that there was there were no sequence reads from the DNA sequencer covering that particular area. So there's coverage, 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 drop off. At the middle of chromosome one, that means that they were not able to cover any variants at all. So this is because the centromere is very, very tightly packed in its own protein. And while the cell may be able to unwrap that packaging inside in order 
to be able to replicate the DNA, we cannot unwrap that molecular packaging in order to be able to sequence it yet. Here's a zoom. Here we are zooming into chromosome one. When you look at the graphs of my sequencing coverage, once again, you see the gap in the centromere. And you'll notice that it kind of dips off at the ends. This is because as you get out towards the telomeres or the pieces of DNA at the very tail ends of the chromosome, it's basically one long strand of DNA packed very tightly. So the ends are where it can kind of get ragged, shredded, snipped off. So telomeres are basically sacrificial genetic material that's meant to be shredded. But because it's meant to be shredded and it's out there at the ends, you can't really sequence it, which is why you can kind of see it dropping off a little here. This is zooming in on the overlapping reads that create my genome. In order to compile a person's genome, this method of sequencing didn't sequence a whole long molecule at once. Instead, it sequenced a whole bunch of, like I said earlier, 200 to 300 base pair molecules, stacking them one on top of the other on top of the other. So you can see the representation of that happening where, here, where they're stacked on top of each other. And you'll notice on the left that these dark green ones are all aligned and then they're connected by a thin little line to something on the right, which is in light green. That's because on the left is the forward, is the forward read. In the middle, that little string is a piece of DNA that was not sequenced, but you know it's in the middle between the forward read on the left and the reverse read on the right. Zooming in closer on the overlapping sequence reads, you can see that the base pairs themselves are lined up. You can see those lines in the middle, again, the piece of DNA that didn't get sequenced, even though it could have been. And the connected sequence reads, right. This band below here is kind of a chromosomal map. You can see which nucleotide everything is located at on chromosome one. And below that, conveniently located, is the human genome reference sequence. So what you have in this picture is your own DNA and a whole bunch of raw reads, a map of where you are in the human genome as related to your own DNA, and then what the reference looks like. Here you can see even more clearly forward reads connected to reverse reads. And this is zooming in even closer to see how all of the reads line up, in this case, perfectly, which means that at every single place in this sequence, I am a homozygote on both of my chromosomes. Sometimes the DNA sequencer will output a variant or say, this nucleotide is here, but it won't be a very strong signal so this is, so these lowercase letters that are circled here in red are the DNA sequencers and the computer algorithms way of telling you, I think it's this, but I'm not really very sure that it's this. But seeing as these lowercase variants of low confidence also line up with uppercase high confidence variants at the same place, you can be pretty sure that at this spot to the right, I am homozygous T and also at this spot to the left. This is another region of my DNA, and in this particular spot, what the purple strings mean are that these are a couple of unpaired reverse reads. So it's a reverse read, but there isn't that piece of DNA in the middle, nor is it connected to a forward read. It's just stuck there all by itself. Fortunately, it's still, useful. It's still fitting into the, to my genome, in order to say these are the nucleotides at this particular location. Sometimes low confidence reads are actually wrong. Looking at these lowercase level letters circled, it's probably kind of difficult to see from over there, but the lowercase letters circled here are marked in red because they don't match the reference, and they also don't match the rest of my sequence which means the rest of my sequence matches the reference and I probably have the variation of 
the reference at that particular point in my DNA, but there was one unclear read from the sequencer. It wasn't very sure of what that was, and there was the wrong answer. So one of the reasons that you have many, many overlapping reads comprising my genome in this format is so that if they overlap many, many times, you can eliminate mistakes like the ones circled here that might otherwise cause me to have an incorrect DNA sequence at that particular point. At one position, though, you'll notice that all the circled letters here are actually capital letters, so they were high confidence reads from the DNA sequencer. And the fact that all of these circled letters are highlighted in red does not mean they're wrong, it just means that they don't match the DNA reference sequence. And since you'll notice that about half of them are red and half of them are normal, half of my DNA matches the reference at that point and half of it doesn't. So at this particular location, I am heterozygous T and C. And actually, at this particular heterozygous location, I have a variant called Factor V Leiden. It's, with, it's within a gene called Factor V. And the Factor V Leiden variant, as I mentioned earlier, predisposes someone to a lot of increased clotting. So now I know from my DNA sequence, and this was also confirmed by 23andMe genotype testing, that I have the Factor V Leiden variant. So I'll need to be careful about increased blood clotting. There aren't a lot of precautions to take now, per se, but later on in life, I probably will want to investigate warfarin medication based on this variant alone. I decided to look a little deeper into the Factor V Leiden variant because I had one mutation, the RS6025 mutation here in red, that I inherited from my father, who also has the Factor V Leiden variant. But I also noticed that in this particular gene, my mother has a few different mutations within the Factor V gene that are called missense mutations. A missense mutation changes the sequence of a protein so that that protein has a different amino acid composition. And depending on the change that gets made, the protein can actually alter its structure and become slightly warped. Also, I know I decided to analyze something called compound heterozygosity. In a normal DNA sequence, what you have is a string of letters, and occasionally you'll have two on top of each other, and you'll realize that you're a heterozygote. But here, you can tell, based on my comparisons of my own DNA to that of my parents and my brother's DNA to that of my parents, you can actually tell which combinations of different variants within the same gene are located on which copies of which chromosomes. So which variant did I get from my mother versus which variant did I get from my dad? At first, this might seem like kind of a neat scientific trick that doesn't really tell you a lot, but actually what it does tell you is more than sequencing, because if you can tell, if you have, say, two different mutations within the same gene, but you have, but those mutations can either be located on the same homologous copy of the gene or on two separate copies of that gene, that means you either have one bad copy of the gene if they're on the same copy, or two bad copies of the gene if they're on different copies. This can mean that either a person with the same genotype is either healthy because there's one clean copy of the gene or sick because they have no clean copies of the gene. So the fact that I had a mutant copy of factor five, the factor five gene from my mother and another different mutant copy of the factor five gene from my dad had me initially slightly worried. So I decided to do a little more investigation into the variants that I got from my mom, because I already know the impact of the Factor V Leiden variant I got from my dad. The result was that I searched all of these variations in green on a website called Polyfen, which shows you a number of studies related to any given variant within the genome that you search. And Polyfen told me that all of these mutations 
actually have about a 22% frequency of occurrence within the, hum the European population. So already that tells you must be pretty benign. And then it showed several studies that showed these are also benign. So I just have one bad copy of factor five, the factor five gene, even though I have two mu mutant copies. Going back to my sequence data, here we can see overlapping reads that have an A while the, sequ while the reference sequence has a T. This doesn't mean that my genome is incorrect. It doesn't mean the reference is incorrect. It just means that my genome doesn't match the reference. So this is what you call a single nucleotide polymorphism or a single nucleotide variant, where at a single point in the genome, I am different. In the same region, you can also see that there's a dash here. And the dash means that my sequence just kept on going from this side to this side, nothing in the middle. But the reference sequence has one more variant in between that gap. So you can see that I'm missing that. And they mark the fact that I'm missing a nucleotide at that, pla at that place with a dash right here. This is a deletion or a place where there's a missing nucleotide of larger size. Instead of one nucleotide, it's three nucleotides long. But deletions don't just have to be one or three nucleotides long. They can be massive. They can be thousands of nucleotides long. And you can actually see in my mother's genome there is a 70,000 base pair deletion that eliminates a gene called RHD. A lot of you are probably familiar with blood testing or blood types where you can have blood types A, B, and O, but you also have a positive or a negative. This gene has to do with the positive or the negative. So if you produce protein from this gene, then you are RH positive because you make RH. If you do not have this gene, then you do not make Rh protein, so you are Rh negative. And what you see in my mother's genome right here is that there is a drop in coverage of her DNA to about one half of what it usually is, telling you that there's just one copy of the Rh gene. So she is heterozygous for Rh positive and Rh negative. Sometimes this leads to a disorder called RH factor incompatibility, but fortunately in my mother, there were no disorders that arose, so she is a heterozygote and perfectly happy. And there are plenty of other Europeans who are heterozygotes and perfectly happy because this is seen in about 40% of Europeans. If you look at my genome, you can see that I did not inherit my mother's Rh negative variation. I inherited the copy of her chromosome that actually did contain the RHD gene, so I am homozygous Rh positive. Looking towards another deletion, you can see that deletions can be perfectly massive and inheritable. This one, this particular deletion actually takes out not one gene, but two. And the two genes that are taken out on chromosome one, you can see they're missing in my dad because there's no coverage here. But my mother has them. So of course, I inherit one deleted copy from my father and one whole copy from my mother. And there are two genes taken out here. LC LCE3C and LCE3B. What impact could this possibly have? Well, depending on the gene, different genes can have different impacts if you're missing them. And these, if you're missing them, as I found out from this paper, lead to an increased risk of psoriasis, which is a medical condition of having very, very dry skin. It leads only to an increased risk, though, and it doesn't necessarily say that if you're missing these, then you're going to have psoriasis. It just increases your chance, depending on a number of other things, that you will have psoriasis if you have this deletion. And this deletion actually didn't necessarily predict psori psoriasis likelihood in my family entirely, because my mother does not have this deletion, and yet she is 
of the four of us, you can see her line in purple, in the 98th percentile of likelihood to have psoriasis as compared to the general population. Whereas my dad, who does have the deletion homozygously, is actually the least likely of the four of us to have psoriasis. So there are definitely a, a number of genotypic and phenotypic factors at play. Both your DNA and your environment can contribute in a lot of complicated ways to even a single simple condition as is your skin dry or is it normal? Just taking another look at the psoriasis risk, there are actually three different lines of evidence for whether or not a person can develop psoriasis. The first is from single nucleotide variants. There have been a number of studies called GWAS, genome-wide association study, that associate a single genetic variant with the likelihood that something will happen to you phenotypically. So they try to line up these two, a genotype with an instance of a phenotype, statistically, and if they do correlate a lot, then the genotype is associated with that phenotype and it increases your chances of having it. Then there are also multi-gene deletions, like the one I just showed, that also have a strong statistical correlation to the production of certain phenotypes or certain outcomes of what your health will be in real life. But also, you can just look at the evidence of if you have the disorder or not in real life. My mother, as you saw, has the highest probability in the family of developing psoriasis, and she actually had a rather strong skin reaction to hair dye. She is deathly allergic, so she is embracing her hair color. <laughs> but also, looking back at these three lines of evidence, you have DNA variants, you have deletions, and then you have what's actually happened, and you can line them up, but it's in a very complicated way, so not even by combining all three lines of evidence do you have a definitive prediction that says, this person will have psoriasis, this person will not. Instead, you just have, is this person likely to have psoriasis, or is this person not likely to have psoriasis? That means that you probably shouldn't immediately pursue treatment for this particular disease based on your gene based on your DNA. Instead, you should be aware that you have a likelihood of developing uncommonly dry skin, so you should keep an eye out for your skin and use some lotion. <laughs> Moving on from the medical findings to some scientific findings, the main two types of scientific findings that I had while analyzing my family's genomes were on genetic recombination which is where the parent's DNA will rearrange itself. The homologous chromosomes will rearrange themselves and exchange pieces of DNA during meiosis, or the division that occurs before making egg and sperm cells that combine later to make you. So I looked at the recombination of DNA between the generations of parents and children, so how different variants can be recombined between generations. And I also looked at compressions, which are places of extra coverage in the genome. So where there's basically more coverage of a certain area. And that typically means that you have an extra sequence in a certain area, usually a duplication of some area, where the reference just has one copy of that area, but you have two copies lined up after each other in a row, so you find that there are twice as many reads lining up in that area as with a normal reference sequence person. Really fast explanation of genetic recombination. This is through a process called crossing over, where in cell division to produce gametes called meiosis, two chromosomes for example, your two homologous, slightly different, but still same chromosome one copies will line up. They'll be cut at the same place. They'll exchange pieces of DNA, and then they will fuse, making two hybrid chromosomes. I was actually able to find the locations where this occurred in my family. <laughs> 
Here you can see a simple family tree of how I can identify maternal versus paternal variants and which copy of a gene I inherited from my mother versus which one I inherited from my dad. My mother is heterozygous AG at a particular arbitrary and insignificant location in the genome, and at that same place, my father is GG. Now, because conveniently, my brother and I are both AG at that location, we can tell that since there's only one A in the parental generation, and it comes from my mother, we inherited the A from her. So we both have the same copy of DNA from her. And we also both know that we inherited a G from my father. But because my father has two Gs instead of one, we can't tell if we both inherited the same G or different Gs from my father. You would have to look at a different variant in the same area of that chromosome in order to be able to tell. This is a paper that, I've, that was the result of my collaboration with some scientists at Stanford University Genetics Department. It was based on the medical analysis of my family's genomes. And as you can see, my father and I are both co-authors on this paper. This is a diagram of genetic recombination within my family that was actually found within that paper. The pink areas are repeat rich areas. So this doesn't have to do with whether my brother and I have the same maternal DNA, the same paternal DNA, or completely different DNA. These are to do with something else. So when it changes to pink, that does not mean genetic recombination has occurred. Same thing with blue. If there's a compression, then that means that there is an extra copy of something that the reference sequence doesn't have. And this diagram can also mark it in light blue areas like that one, but it does not signify recombination. What signifies recombination are changes from red, which means maternal identical, to green, which means completely identical. So you can see that my brother and I, wherever we change from having the same DNA on one parent to the same DNA from both parents, that means that at some point in our parents' gamete production, there was a meiotic crossover where two homologous chromosomes exchanged pieces of DNA. And that's why you have different combinations of variants and we'll go from having the same DNA only on our mother's side to having the same DNA on both sides. A compression is defined as an area in the genome where there is a repeat that the reference sequence does not include. So if the reference sequence has one copy of a sequence and then you have another copy of that sequence right after it, then they won't add an extra area into the genome just for you. They'll just have your extra copy of that sequence piled right on top of the other. And you'll see that there are twice as many reads in that area as in others. So looking for areas like this of increased coverage means that you probably have an extra copy of something. This is a poster presentation on compressions. It was the result of a collaboration that I did with the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. They were, the Institute for Systems Biology actually sequenced the first family of four to ever be sequenced. We were, we were the second family of four to be sequenced. We were after them by about a month. We thought we were going to be the first family of four, but they beat us to it. So we found about their work that way, and a collaboration was initiated. And now we've looked at areas of repeats in the genome. You can see that this is an area of normal coverage in this chart, followed by a duplication, and then it goes back to normal. So we compared two families of four and later a number of other samples that were added in at the last minutes in order to present this particular poster at the Marco Island 2011 conference in Florida. Not only have I been able to 
learn a lot about my family's DNA medically and scientifically. It's also contributed a lot to my own education in a lot of formal and informal ways. I've learned a lot about the role that DNA plays in health, the connection between family trees and molecular genetics, so how certain variants can be passed on from parents to children and how things recombine between generations. <coughs> I've also learned a lot about bioinformatics and its role in interpreting DNA since I had to come up with an efficient method for finding meiotic crossovers where I compared my DNA to my brother's and was able to find locations where two homologous chromosomes crossed over that way and actually point out, okay, this is where it happened. Later on, I realized that even though genome-wide association studies can tell you a lot about your probability of getting a disease, though they have a lot of diagnostic value, there's a link missing because as I'm sure a lot of people here have learned in Biology 101, DNA is transcribed to RNA, which becomes protein, and protein is what actually serves as a functional unit within your body to produce a certain result. So depending on what happens with your protein, that can change your phenotype. And if you learn, instead of this variant is associated with this phenotype, that this variant causes this to happen within you and this phenotype results, then instead of having a predictor, now you understand how something happens and then you can start taking the first steps to the cure. And lastly, but certainly not least, I have been able to share what I've learned from my analysis of my family's genomes medically scientifically, and personally with other people. I've pursued a couple of educational experiences outside my analysis of my family's genomes on my own. The first was my internship at the church lab. I actually had two summers of internships, the first one in 2010 and the second one in 2011. And in both summers, I was looking at a very variants or single nucleotide polymorphisms within the genome of unknown significance and unknown sequencing accuracy. So, for example, I would find a variant that showed up in a healthy person that certain papers said was a predictor of certain disease and often it would be something very, very harmful. And I would think, okay, well, there's a discrepancy because this very harmful variant is showing up in someone who's very, very healthy and thriving. And what actually was usually the case was that the evidence for these particularly harmful variants was, it wasn't flimsy, it was just that it came from sources of families where there was a certain amount of inbreeding. So you get families where there are a lot of people who have a lot of genetic material in common. So if you want to track down a disease variant for a disease that only shows up in this family in order to identify what causes this disease, and you have people who have much of the same genetic material, isolating a single variant or even a few within that family is going to be very hard and often you can't reach outside of that family in order to identify what causes the disease because nobody else outside that family has this one particular small disease. So a lot of the evidence around variants like these needed re-examining and someone to say, okay, this is the case and you do have evidence that this variant is deleterious, but maybe you need to realize that it's not based on data from a lot of people, it's based on data from just a few. My second educational experience outside of the analysis of my family's genomes was actually summer 2013 or last summer. I was working at the Walker Lab at MIT under Professor Graham Walker and mentored by Dr. Kinran Yamaka. And I was actually able in this summer of research to look at the connection between DNA, protein, and phenotype. In this case, in the generation of genetic mutations. So what happened in some of the DNA variants I was looking at 
was that there were polymerases or proteins that go along the DNA and replicate it. And usually they have a mechanism where they can correct their own mistakes. They can go back and kind of proofread themselves. But what happened in mutant polymerases is that instead of proofreading themselves, they would go without correcting their own, mis own mistakes and produce 10,000 times as many errors as a normal DNA polymerase. So now you've identified a mutation in the DNA to make these proteins and the effect that it has on the protein and the phenotypic effect of these mutant polymerases is that they make carcinogenic mutations or leave a whole bunch of mutations in a cell after it just normally divides. Say you're making more skin cells and you have this mutation, you might make a whole bunch of mutant skin cells and then suddenly, for no reason, you have skin cancer. So I was looking at the ways that these polymerases work and ways that they could possibly be inhibited or stopped. These were some of the ethical considerations, just to wrap up my presentation, that my family faced when we were deciding to be sequenced by Illumina. We might have found that I was not the genetic offspring of my parents, but I already knew that from 23andMe, and also, you tend to notice when you look a lot like someone, so it was fairly obvious. We might have found disease risks, potentially with no cure, but it was actually advantageous to know about disease risks, for example, for my father to know about Factor V Leiden, because now that he knows about it, he can take action and treat it and take preventative measures. We might also have discovered, to skim through the rest, bad news we wish we hadn't found out, but we weren't feeling particularly afraid. Ethnic roots that we didn't like, but were open-minded to having almost any ethnic roots, and we don't mind being part Neanderthal either. The biggest concern, probably, was that our genetic data might be used against our interests, but Gina, is supposed to pre prevent genetic discrimination. There have not been any court cases revolving around Gina as of yet, and I don't particularly want to be the person to test that, but I'm happy that that law is in place. And lastly, the sequencing procedure is not perfect, but we knew this going in. We were already familiar with the technology and that there are certain areas of the genome that simply cannot be sequenced, such as the telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes or the centromeres at the middle. And we decided that most of a genome is better than having no genome at all, so we went ahead and got sequenced. Here are some people I would like to thank. My family, first of all. Dr. George Church, Dr. Madeline Price Ball, and the Church Lab for letting me work there. And the same thing with Dr. Graham Walker, Dr. Kinran Yamaka, and the Walker Lab for allowing me to intern there. I'd like to thank Wellesley College, which is where I currently go to school, the Brown Symposium organizers, Institute for Systems Biology, Stanford University Medical School, and 23andMe for genotyping my family first in 2007, and Illumina for sequencing us in 2010. Thank you for your attention. Oh, and this is from New Year's Day in Antarctica, in case anyone's wondering. Thanks, Anne. Fascinating. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll try and get the microphone down to you. So there's a question right here. Has there been any uh, examples of twins versus different children? In other words, if your parents had had twins, would you have expected a different outcome? If my parents had, ha had had twins, then things would be very different. I wouldn't be able to find genetic crossing over because I wouldn't be able to compare the maternal and paternal D 
DNA of two twins because it would all be the exact same. So I wouldn't be able to have the scientific results of finding locations where meiotic crossing over occurred. That would probably be the main difference in the scientific process. In the medical process, if I had a twin, then I would probably have to do a lot more making sure that my twin was okay with being sequenced. Because if you sequence one twin, then you've effectively sequenced both. And if my twin didn't want things ever being published or released or even found out or known to the two of us, then that twin would probably have the right to stop me from being sequenced. Fortunately, my brother was very happy to be sequenced, and though he has absolutely no wish to publish his own data, and I don't blame him, he is perfectly okay with finding out the contents of his own genome. And so, so I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any parts of your genome that you really don't want to look at? Like Watson didn't want to look at the, uh, the, the gene that predisposes to Alzheimer's. Um, there are not any parts of my genome that I don't want to look at. I already know that I have a fairly healthy phenotype. So right off the bat, that tells me that phenotypically, I have nothing to hide. If someone finds out something about my DNA, chances are it's not going to be particularly bad. And as for the Alzheimer's variants, I think I would be OK finding out whether or not I had Alzheimer's. I've examined that set of variants, and I'm not going to disclose the results here. but. If you do find out that you have a predisposition for Alzheimer's, even though there is no cure available, you can still campaign for more money to be given to research, give money to, to research yourself, participate in research by either being an experimental subject or by helping conduct some of the experiments yourself. And there are also many preventative measures that you can take in order to make your environment such that you reduce your risk of actually getting the disease later on in life. So no, I don't think I would be averse to finding out anything of that nature in my genome. I had a question oh. um, from the diverse fields that you have like engaged in from like proteins uh, different genes, um, many others, um, such as like um, the cancer mutation factors and whatnot. Um, what field would you uh, think it's the most relevant or the one that fascinates you the most or has like the most potential? Um, I think the fields that fascinate me the most are probably the compound heterozygosity because it's a result that you can only achieve by looking at the the genetic data of a family and the results of knowing where your genetic material is located actually have some really significant medical consequences that I didn't expect to spring up. And the other favorite field in genetics that I think has a lot of potential is the one where you can connect DNA to protein to a phenotypic result because you can figure out the pathway that DNA leads to phenotype and once you've figured out Instead of, oh, this mutation means that you get cancer later on, possibly, you can figure out, oh, this mutation leads to a mutant polymerase that causes DNA to become mutated and messed up in many, many cell divisions. And now you have a mutant protein that you can attempt to stop. And I think that's where medical genetics can really go in the future, because if you can intervene in certain pro in the process between DNA and phenotype that you want to stop, you have a cure. Yeah, j just first of all, a comment. Uh, if you're predisposed to Alzheimer's, speaking two languages gives you 5.8 more years. Environment's important. <laughs> Uh, I thought that was a wonderful presentation, and there's another clue up on the screen. Did you look at behavioral genetics? Did you look at repeats of the dopamine transporter? Um, unfortunately, no. It, it's something you really might want to look at. It, it, it turns out that in East Africa, the prevalence of repeats is 0%, and it goes up to 20% in South America, because all the restless people migrated. And you seem to have an incredible adventurous sense in, in your family as well. And I, I would suggest you look at that. It might be interesting. <laughs>
Thank you.